Grace and peace to you, church. Welcome to worship with Amity Presbyterian Church. It is good to gather with all of you here. Those of you online, it's wonderful. Welcome, whether you have worshiped here hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times, or whether this is the first time you are here, you are welcome, wildly welcome in this place. Um, in your bulletin, there is lots of information. Mm, next to last page somewhere, you'll find some announcements. Um, I do want to also mention, um, offer a thank you to our Seekers Fellowship group. Some folks from that group came yesterday to, uh, it was yesterday, right? Yesterday? Yeah, to clean the sanctuary, to clean up some around the church grounds. So thank you to those of you who came to do that. It takes a lot to care for this big church building that we have been privileged to care for. In Jesus' name. So thank you to those who came to do that. Yes. Every single pew in this church was So and the men were really good about going around the side and then uh, even Tom went out to the bricks in the front and got the moss off the bricks. So if you go out that door Make sure you admire the bricks out there. Thank, thank you for you. everybody who came. Yeah, thank you, everybody. And, and where the vehicles and stuff are kept, every single one of those things were clean. Yes, yes. Praise the Lord. <laughs> thank you to everybody who helped with that. I know that is no easy task, so it's really greatly appreciated. Um, you'll see in your bulletin, Easter Lily. Um, slip there. If you would like to purchase an Easter lily in honor or memory of someone, those will be in here on Easter Sunday. Um, so you are welcome to fill that out and let's see, received by Sunday, March 17th. <gasps> That's today. <laughs> um, so please get those and you can put them in the offering plate is a, the easiest way to do that. And because next Sunday is Palm Sunday already. It's almost Easter, but not yet. <laughs> not just yet. Um, along those lines, if you look on the back of your bulletin, you will see the things that are happening during Holy Week. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday, and then we're going to do something a little different this year than we've done the last couple years. We, instead of a Monday Thursday service, we are going to have a Good Friday Tenebrae service, which if you're not familiar with Tenebrae, there's a little explanation, if you like, on there. But it's a service of darkness. We'll, we're going to begin with communion and then move into that tenebrae service, which tells the last moments of Jesus' life. Along with candles, it gets darker and darker to remind us 
of the darkness when Christ's light left the world as we await the joy and the glory of Easter morning. It's a beautiful, really important service um, to mark those moments during Holy Week and not skip right from Palm Sunday to Easter. So um, it tell, it, well, we did the Stations of the Cross last, the last couple years. We've had those where you could move around. This is an actual worship service at 6.30, so it's a little different. Yeah. Um, and we'll be worshiping together as a whole church, African Fellowship and the 11 o'clock service. So that is at 6.30 on Friday. So make plans to join us there. All right. Friends, let's turn to God in worship as we begin with prayer. God among us, we gather in the name of your Son to learn love for one another. We are broken people in so many ways, but still you call us together and you call us loved. Through your living word and worship, teach us to listen and to forgive. Loosen the hold sin has on us and bind us to your way of peace. Turn our minds to your wisdom and our hearts to your grace. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus, who stands at the heart of our gathering. Amen. Amen. Beloved, let's rise and call one another to worship with the words in your bulletin. Wherever two or three are gathered in Christ's name, God is here among us. Come, let us worship the God of creation, the God of people, the God of community. Let us follow Jesus, for Jesus is the way. Let us worship together in faith as we sing hymn 826, Lift High the Cross. That's in your purple hymnal.
When Jesus taught his disciples how to pray, he gave them the words, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. He was teaching them to confess their sin, to confess to God and to others, to tell the truth about what has gone wrong, and to tell the truth about their need for grace. So the point of this is not to beg at the feet of an angry God. Beloved, the point is to open our hearts and our lives to the ways that God wants to change us and only the ways that God can do. So together each week we confess. We confess our sin and we are reassured of God's grace. So let's do that. Once again, together this morning, we will begin our prayer in song, then with the words in the bulletin, and then in silence. Let us pray. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart. Together we make our confession. Almighty God, in Jesus we find our guide for living as people of faith. He even gave us words to pray that show us how to trust, forgive, and love. Forgive us for not following the example he sets, for not seeking your will to be done in our lives. Instead of graciously receiving our daily bread from you, we take more than we need at the expense of our neighbors. We so often fail to forgive others, holding on to our anger and bitterness. Free us from the sin that keeps us bound, and help us to truly be Jesus' disciples, walking in his way of life. Amen. Beloveds, just as we are taught to pray for our daily bread, God's forgiveness, God's offer of forgiveness is ours. It is given, it is offered every day, every moment of our lives. God's offer of grace is endless. And it is for all of us so that we can then share it with others. So, church, hear and believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. Let's sing of the good news of the gospel, that Jesus loves us as the children come to the front. Jesus loves me, this I know.
guys today? Yeah? You good? I'm glad to see you. Last week, I wasn't here. <laughs> Some of you were here, right? Yeah? You weren't, and you weren't, but you were. And you guys went with Tate, right? And, and Miss Debbie, and you talked about forgiveness. That's right. You talked about forgiveness, something Jesus talks a lot about. And actually, that's what we're focusing on in worship today. And Tate shared with me, he told me he told you he was going to do it, so I hope it's okay. He shared with me the thoughts, the things that you guys had about forgiveness and about why it's important to forgive. So I thought it might be helpful. I figured we'd have some folks here today that weren't there last week. So is it okay with you if I share what you guys said about why it's important to forgive with our other friends? Okay, I wrote them down. Well, you wrote them down, and then I wrote them down. We should forgive because it's what God does. When you forgive your enemies, it makes you feel good and the other person feel good. When we forgive others for their sins, our sins are forgiven. We should forgive because it's bad to hold a grudge. Those are really great thoughts about why we forgive. You guys are some really wise people. You are. I'm grateful. I'm grateful. So one of you said, it's not good to hold a grudge. Yeah. So let's talk about that. Have you ever held a grudge? Yeah, not against another person, mm-hmm. but against, like, like, like a long time ago. You say, I'm so mad at you. Mm-hmm. Yep. Somebody did something that made you mad, and you just, like, hold on to that mad. It's the opposite of forgiveness, right? Yeah. It is. It is. It's hard to forgive sometimes. It's hard not to hold a grudge when we get hurt, when somebody does something that hurts us, right? It's hard to not hold on to that mad. I want you guys, did you, I don't know if you did this with Tate last week, but do it again if you did. Okay, did you take your fists like this? Did you do this with Tate last week? No? Oh, good, okay. All right. And squeeze them as tightly as you can. Hold them as like, you doing it, Dylan? Hold your, squeeze your fist as tightly as you can. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Kind of starts to hurt, yeah. right? Yep, keep going, keep going, keep going. This is kind of like what anger feels like when you're holding a grudge. Oh, I know, I know, it hurts, right? The longer you do it, it hurts more, doesn't it? No. Yeah, okay, now, now do like this. Oh. And open your fist and let go. We might have some, do you have some fingernail marks in your palms? I do, yeah. That's like when we hold on to anger like that, that's kind of what it feels like inside us when we can't let it go. It just gets tighter and tighter and starts to hurt, and it's all we can think about, right? And it might even make some kind of permanent marks in there, right? It just sticks. When we get hurt, sometimes it makes permanent marks in there, right? But we can let go. Forgiveness is like when we release, right? When we opened our hands up, and we can let go of that anger. It's hard to do. Have you ever had a hard time forgiving somebody? Yeah, like uh, someone's frustrated. Mm-hmm. And it's like, oh my gosh, like this is like in the background. I'm yeah. still mad at that. Yeah. And it's like, I can't believe you did this. Yeah. It is. It is. Because it doesn't make the wrong go away, right? The thing that happened, it doesn't just go away like it never happened. It still happened, right? And so it's hard. That's what Jesus taught us is uh, why it's important to forgive. That it's, yes, it's hard, but when we forgive, like God forgives us when we mess up, we can forgive others, and it helps us feel better, and it helps that other person who maybe did the thing that hurt, it helps them make, know that they're still loved and that they can make different choices going forward, right? Maybe they won't do it again. Me. But it gives them grace forgiveness. So I'm going to just go ahead and guess that all of you sometime this week or in the coming weeks, you're going to have to make a choice to forgive somebody because somebody's going to do something you wish they hadn't done. It's going to happen at school, at home, at families. Anyway, it, it happens, right? So if you have a hard time, you find yourself in that spot thinking, I cannot let go of my anger. I don't want to forgive this person. That, my friends, is when you pray. Okay? And God can help us. So I'm going to teach you this little prayer, right? So we're going to do what we just did. We're going to close our fists, 
right? And we're going to say, God, I am angry right now. God, I am angry right now. And you can be as angry as you want to be, and in that moment, you can say what you're angry about. You're going to hold your anger like this, and then you're going to open your hands and say, help me let go and forgive them. Help me let go and forgive them. Let's try it one more time. Close your fists up. God, I am angry right now. And then you open your face. Help me let go and forgive them. Amen. Okay, so remember that as best you can. If you need a reminder, ask your grown-ups that are with you to help you remember, okay? Sometimes we do, we move our bodies too. It helps us remember and it helps us let go, okay? And ask God to help you. And God will help. It may not be immediate, but God will help, okay? It's good to ask, all right? You guys... That's our prayer for the morning. So you can go to the playground and worship from back there with your ears open and listen to the story about forgiveness.
Our first scripture reading for today comes from Matthew 6, verses 9 through 15, and that's in 1508 in the Pew Bible. Both of today's scripture readings come from the Gospel of Matthew. The first reading is chapter 6. Listen for God's word to us today. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. And now we turn, jump over a few chapters to chapter 18 in Matthew's Gospel, verses 15 to 20. Listen to Jesus' words about forgiveness. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault, just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth, will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. And then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. This is the word of God, and it is for us, the people of God. Thanks to God. Let's rise and sing glory to God. Glory be to the Father. journeying through Lent with our worship series called Questions to God, where we've given ourselves the space to ask some of the big questions of faith that most of us, I'd say, have carried at some point in our lives, maybe even now. I hope that you have allowed yourself to ask God questions outside of worship, too, when you're praying, when you're in conversation with others. And I hope that you are finding that God meets you in your questions with grace and with space. Because the questions themselves are holy, church. And your willingness to ask them is faithful. So during Lent, we've asked, who is God? We've asked, is the Bible reliable? We've asked, why does church matter? Last week when I was away, Reverend Aaron Toller led us into the big, age-old, unanswerable question, why do bad things happen to good people? That was a powerful word that the Holy Spirit spoke through Aaron, and I am so grateful. So now here we are, 
on week five in Lent, the week before Palm Sunday and Holy Week begins, and we are asking the question today, how do I forgive? Forgiveness. We know that we're supposed to forgive, right? Usually we're taught that early in our lives, especially if we came up in church. It's the Christian thing to do, to forgive. Most of us accept that it's something that we are supposed to do. But do we know why it matters? And surely we have to ask the question, do we know how to actually do it? Forgive. It's a common word in our casual conversations. Forgive me, I've forgotten your name. Or, well, forgive and forget, oh well. In worship each week, we remind ourselves of the importance and the power when we pray the Lord's Prayer, forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors, or when we confess our sin. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. It's a word that appears in some of the, the deepest, most painful, most transformational moments in our lives, Beloved, please forgive me. Mom, I forgive you. The struggle to forgive, the need for forgiveness, it seems to have been written into the very fabric of our existence. Forgiveness, or the lack of forgiveness, it can shape our days. It can manipulate our emotions, our thoughts. It has a very real power, doesn't it? Have you ever made a mistake that needed forgiveness from someone else who wouldn't give it to you? That experience will prove to anyone the power that forgiveness holds. Anyone here who has ever been deeply hurt by another, and I'm willing to bet that is every single one of us, Anyone here knows that forgiveness, it is not a matter of the head, of weighing pros and cons and tallying offenses and apologies, is it? It's a matter of the heart. Attempting to forgive it feels like, well, I'll speak for myself. To me, it feels like a mysterious and uncontrollable task. It's like attempting to untangle a big ball of knotted up string, right? Where you free one section only to find that another has become more entangled. But, but then every once in a while, you, you pull, you tug on just the right spot. And some part of the knot that you've been wrestling with for a while seems to just fall away on its own. Maybe you can see the two ends of the string between hurt and forgiveness, but the way from one end to the other is this constantly changing, kind of jumbled up mess. Most of the time, it is really hard to forgive. Yet, it is this notion, this act of forgiving that is at the center of the gospel, grace, the gospel, the very heart of God, they're all wrapped up in forgiveness. So much so that after teaching his disciples to pray for God's forgiveness and for the ability to forgive others, he told them that how they forgive one another is directly linked to how God forgives them. In Bible study on Wednesday, we wrestled with those verses that Faye read from chapter 6, where Jesus says, If you forgive others when they sin against you, God will forgive your sins. But if you don't forgive others for their sins against you, God won't forgive yours. Oof. Those are tough, confusing words from Jesus, aren't they? We kind of were surprised by them in Bible study. How is anything that God does contingent on what I do? God is God, and I am just me. 
And God knows that, right? <laughs> I don't know that we reached a simple, clear, easy, satisfying answer to that because forgiveness isn't at all simple. It's messy. It's really messy sometimes. But surely Jesus' words here are a sign. A sign to us that when it comes to forgiving others, the state of our hearts, how we treat others and we respond, respond to others when they harm us, it really matters to God. Our unwillingness to forgive binds others and us in that pattern of sin and harm. But when we loosen our hold, when we find forgiveness, there is grace for the other and grace for us. What we bind and what we loosen on earth is somehow felt in the kingdom of heaven, this binding and loosening. It is central to the message of the gospel. So we are to take it seriously because it really matters in ways we don't understand yet. Well, great. <laughs> this big jumbled up mess confusing, tangled ball of mess is something that, that I can't usually seem to do, but it is at the heart of the gospel. Great. <laughs> but the good news, church, the good news is that we are not alone in our struggle to forgive, or at least we don't have to be. And in the Bible, there is guidance for us. In the second scripture passage, Jesus paints what appears to be a rather simple and straightforward picture of forgiveness in the church, at least. Jesus, who usually answers questions in, in um, or answers with questions and teaches with stories, he for once gives us this step-by-step -step set of directions. You can almost see it on a shelf in a Christian bookstore. Three simple steps to forgiveness. By Jesus Christ, author of other books like How to Turn a Good Wedding Party into a Great One, and Samaritan to the Rescue, <laughs> all these bestsellers. His three simple steps to forgiveness reads as follows. If a member of the church sins against you, step one, address it privately, just the two of you. If that doesn't work, step two, take two or three others with you. Keep the discussion honest. If that doesn't work, step three, make the church aware of the sin and address the issue publicly. And if none of these three steps work, well, then it would seem that you have done all that you can do. Seems simple enough, right? <laughs> can you imagine putting Jesus' instructions into practice in your own life? How about here at Amity? Can you imagine what that might be like? Barbara Brown Taylor, she told a great story about this in one of her sermons. She asks you to imagine that you let Joe, a neighbor and a fellow church member, borrow your lawnmower. You wait a few weeks. As your grass gets taller and taller, you wait for him to bring it back until finally you have to ask him about it. This is when he tells you that he let his friend borrow it, and his friend backed over it with his truck, and the lawnmower is no more. <laughs> Joe considers it simply bad luck, and the matter is closed, but you... Though you attempt to let it go, you feel wronged. You have to buy another mower, and the fact that he doesn't seem to feel bad about ruining yours, well, it just starts to ugh, gnaw and eat away at you, and you can't let it go. So hearing the words of Jesus, you go to Joe's house one day to talk it over, and you explain that you would be willing to take just half of what the lawnmower was worth for the sake of your friendship. But Joe is offended. 
He refuses to accept responsibility for someone else backing over the lawnmower. These things happen, and it stinks, he says, but it just wasn't his fault. So you go home, and you call up two church members who agree to go with you to Joe's the next day. And upon your arrival, Joe opens the door and he instantly gets furious. How dare you drag his name through the mud, ganging up on him like that? This is a believable story, I think. You explain in the presence of others that you have reconsidered and you're willing to report the loss to the insurance company if Joe will just be willing to tell them what happened. But before you can finish, Joe yells at you to get off his property and he slams the door in your face. (laughs) So what do you do next? Well, clearly, you call everyone in the church (laughs) and you ask them to meet you at Joe's house the next Saturday morning. You figure that he won't answer the door, so you make big signs. And these big signs say, forget the lawnmower, Joe. We are your friends, or come out and talk, Joe. On Saturday, everyone is milling about Joe's lawn, carrying signs and watching Joe's house, which is still and quiet. Nothing happens for a while until one slat of one mini blind (laughs) comes down and you know that Joe sees you. You smile and you wave and you ask him to come outside and Again, nothing until finally. Out comes Joe onto the front porch, standing sheepishly with the check for the lawnmower in his hand. The crowd cheers. You and Joe hug, and the matter is put behind you. The end. (laughs) Does this story ring true? (laughs) Can you imagine that happening? I mean, I've never tried anything like that before, but... Maybe it would. It's just different enough, unpredictable enough. It just might work. But maybe, maybe Jesus' three simple steps to forgiveness are not so simple. If you're anything like me, when you're wronged, your tendency is to try and explain it away. Maybe you hold on to things and get mad, or maybe you explain them away. Maybe that person isn't aware that they hurt you, right? Maybe, maybe they just had a bad day. They didn't mean to anyway. Just drop it. The issue will pass, right? Avoid conflict. Some of us are really good at that. But Jesus challenges this tendency of ours directly. Jesus says, don't ignore it. Confront it. If your brother or sister sins against you, go and point it out. Don't be satisfied with burying it outwardly when inside the wound continues to grow. Conflict, sin, pain, these things matter. They affect us, and they can be toxic to any life in community. Notice I said can be. They aren't always. Conflict, sin, and pain can also be ingredients for reconciliation, for transformation, for healing. If we make that our goal, if those are the things we seek in forgiveness. So this is a very important point, church. What is your goal in seeking to forgive. Before embarking on this difficult journey of forgiveness, you must ask yourself another question. Is this relationship worth the risk? Hopefully the answer is yes. As Christians especially, and within the church especially, We are called to put ourselves out there, on the line, take risks to restore even the most difficult of broken relationships because we've seen it happen. And we believe that with God it is possible, and so we seek out that kind of healing and restoration that the world says is impossible. 
we say it is possible. I have lived it, I have experienced it, and I will seek it out. But this is important. There are times in life when the hurt is so deep, the risk to ourselves or our safety is so great, that the answer to that question, is this relationship worth the risk? It might be no, or at least no for now. And that's okay. It's okay. If you find yourself in that place, pray. Just pray. God knows your heart. God knows your hurt. God hears you, and God is with you. C.S. Lewis wrote once, Last week in prayer I discovered, or at least I think I did, that I suddenly was able to forgive someone that I'd been trying to forgive for over 30 years. The ability to forgive, church, it is always a gift. It's always a gift from God. It's just that sometimes that gift comes later because the hurt is deeper and the healing takes longer. In those places, offer yourself grace too. But if your answer is yes to the question, is the relationship worth the risk, then Jesus challenges us by pulling us out of our isolation and making forgiveness an act of the community. That's hard. <laughs> There's times when we are quick to involve friends or other church members to address someone's sin, but those times are rarely constructive, are they? More often, the point of those times is to get someone on our side, to tell as many people our side of the story so everyone will know what really happened, right, and we can make it clear who is wrong. <laughs> But Jesus asks us to involve others when resolving conflict for different reasons. To keep both parties accountable, to keep it honest, to maintain the dignity of both the victim and the offender. The same goal applies whether it's a conversation with a few people or with the body as a whole. Think mediation rather than angry mob, <laughs> right? The goal should always be reconciliation, not retribution. Restoration, not vengeance. But what are we to make of Jesus' instruction that if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, then treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector? That seems a little harsh, doesn't it? Sounds like we just give up hope on that person. There's some people we just can't reach. Well, Christians have used this verse to justify excommunication, to justify exclusion from the body of Christ. And while I'm willing to admit there are people I can't rehabilitate or make amends with, I have trouble thinking Jesus would be so willing to permanently cast someone out of the community, out of the beloved community of believers, just because their heart or their mind couldn't be changed in the moment. The word pagan in this verse is usually translated as Gentile, meaning those who are not Jewish, because he was speaking to the Jewish community. And throughout the Gospels, Jesus regularly seeks out the company of Gentiles and tax collectors. They've become devoted disciples. This is not a get-out-of-jail-free card, folks. <laughs> Jesus seeks them out over and over. Maybe when he tells us to treat them as we would a Gentile or a tax collector, he's instructing us to not exclude them, but to make extra effort to bring them back in. Dare I say, evangelize. Sometimes Presbyterians get uncomfortable with that word. Sometimes we're so concerned with maintaining purity and uniformity within the church that we miss the joyful messiness of extending its reach of seeing people and lives truly changed by the power of God's grace lived out in community. Church, that kind of change, those kinds of relationships, they are rarely simple and easy. They're messy 
really messy sometimes. Offering and receiving forgiveness is messy. There's no simple three-step solution that works every time. It's a process, and it's a process done in community. In church, we resist community. We really do, especially when it comes to sin and grace. We want those things to be personal and private. We American Christians especially, we like our notion of individuality, don't we? We like the ability to come and go as we please, to see ourselves as autonomous beings. My beliefs influence my actions, and I will live the life of my choosing. Even at church, we see ourselves as this collection of like-minded individuals. But Jesus' words here, they challenge that thinking. He reminds us that we're called to be more than that. No, we are more than that already. We are the body of Christ. We are connected directly, eternally. Each part affects the others, right? The eye cannot say to the hand, I do not need you. The head cannot say to the feet, I do not need you. We are joined together not just spiritually, but functionally. Each word that you speak as an individual, each action that you take, it affects the whole body of Christ. In fact, you could say that everything you do, you do on behalf of the body of Christ, whether you claim it or not. Ooh, that's a bit intimidating. I'm almost done, church. I know I'm going long. Verse 18. It says, truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So Jesus, you're telling me, whatever I do or say, it doesn't just have an effect on me or the people near me, but my actions might change things on earth, in heaven, in all of God's kingdom." That's a lot of power. We must ask ourselves and one another, how will we use that power? How will you use it? Will you use it to bind, to trap, to perpetuate brokenness, to avoid forgiving, to avoid seeking forgiveness? That's to continue to trap the people involved in a broken relationship. How easy it is to bind. But take heart, church. Because we've been given the power to loosen, to loose, to free, to release, to restore. When we offer forgiveness, we do not offer our own forgiveness. We offer God's forgiveness. How awesome is that? We offer God's forgiveness. When when you say, I forgive you, it changes the course of the universe. It fundamentally changes things. When you forgive, you unleash the kingdom of God. You change a world in desperate need of grace and restoration. That's a privilege, church. Our God has given us the power to unleash the kingdom, and our God is with us every step of the way. What we say matters. What we do matters. We've been given incredible, heart-changing, world-changing power. So how will we use it? Our first step to answering that question today is to use the words of our affirmation of faith to commit ourselves or recommit ourselves to letting go of harmful things and then binding or fastening ourselves to kingdom things, things that restore and heal, that bring new life. So let's rise in body or spirit and affirm our faith in the God of grace, using the words in your bulletin. Join me. Jesus spoke these words. I assure you that whatever you fasten on earth will be fastened in heaven. 
Whatever you loosen on earth will be loosened in heaven. And so we will loosen from fear of asking and fasten to humble curiosity. Loosen from binary thinking and fasten to infinite love. Loosen from retributive vengeance and fasten to restorative justice. Loosen from empty apologies and fasten to acts of repentance. Loosen from collaborative resentment and fasten to healing conversation. Loosen from the shackles of anger and fasten to freedom that comes through forgiveness. Loosen from traumatic pain and fasten to radical grace. I will loosen from self-doubt and fasten to blessed assurance that I am a child of God, fasten to the joy of my sacred value, fasten to my connection with the divine, fasten to the continuity of overflowing spirit. We will let forgiveness set us free. My friends, have a seat. Take those with you. I know there's a lot of words for that. Maybe take it with you this week and reflect on how you do those things in your life or how you might. Let's pray. God of creation, God who restores broken things and broken people to new life, we, your people, we come to you again with our list of where your healing is needed. Lord, there are people in our lives that we know and love, people in our families, in this church family, people who are living with illness, both visible and unseen, those who are grieving, those who feel isolated or lonely, anxious or afraid. So, Lord, we ask for your healing presence to be known in their lives, in their bodies, in their communities. Lord, we look around and we see a world that seems to be at war with itself. People, families, communities, nations trapped in cycles of violence and harm. Ours are no exception. Lord, redeem and restore. Change us and heal us. Give us the courage that you gave to your prophets to speak up in the face of injustice. The courage to refuse to keep participating in cycles of anger and vengeance that perpetuate the harm and increase the brokenness. Lord, give us the hope that we need. Give us the holy imagination to see a future full of healing and life. To work to create faith communities centered around radical grace and welcome, rather than ones defined by who is right or wrong, who is in or out. God of grace, help us really experience the grace that we say we believe in. Teach us how. Help us to forgive ourselves and others. Lord, in this silent moment, bring to our minds and our hearts the person, the people that you are encouraging us to forgive. Show us right now who and where in our life we need to practice forgiveness. In these relationships, these situations, God help us to forgive as best we know how in this moment. Help us to let go. We let go of our anger and take hold of holy compassion. We let go of the heavy weight of bitterness. We trust the way that you can free us from it. And we let go. 
of the familiar comfort of being the victim. Help us to step into the God-given power of forgiveness that will release us and them from this brokenness that binds us. Healing God, through the holy mystery of forgiveness, heal us all. So hear your people now, Lord, as we pray these familiar words that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Giving our financial resources to God's work in the world is a powerful way to live into the Christ in, to live into Christ's prayer that God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If you have ever been healed by forgiveness or found healing by forgiving another, may your gift today be a sign of your gratitude. If you're in need of forgiveness today or if you need to do some forgiving, may your gift serve as a prayer asking for it. By our gifts and by our prayers, may God's will be done. You can give to God through our church website or the offering plates at the front and rear of the sanctuary as you leave today. In our giving, may God set us free. Now let us rise and lift our voices and sing, Here I Am, Lord, number, hymn number 69 in the new hymn books.
beloveds, God is calling us. God is calling us to go just as we are right now. Imperfect people who need to forgive and need to be forgiven, we are sent as we are to love the world, to feed, to embrace, to proclaim, to care, to redeem, to restore. We are sent as you go, know that you do not go alone. You can't. <laughs> the love of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you now and always. Let's sing our amen. <laughs>